Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Elaine Cho, and I'm the Neurology Integrated Care Manager for Azi Pharmaceuticals. And today I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our first speaker for you today. This is Dr. Jacqueline French, who will be discussing advances in therapy for epilepsy. Dr. French serves as the Chief Medical Innovation Officer for the Epilepsy Foundation and is a professor of neurology in the Comprehensive Epilepsy Center at NYU Langone School of Medicine and founder director of the Epilepsy Study Consortium, an academic group that has performed a number of early phase clinical trials in epilepsy and has developed new methodologies for epilepsy trials. Dr. French has focused her research efforts on development of new therapeutics for epilepsy and new methodologies for clinical trials. Over the past 20 years, she has served as the principal investigator on a number of trials for new epilepsy drugs. She is responsible for creation of a, new, a number of new trial designs that have been accepted by regulatory authorities for new drug approval. Dr. French has been active in creating guidelines for the American Academy of Neurology and the International League Against Epilepsy. She has served as chair of the International League Against Epilepsy North, America, North American Regional Commission and Commission on Therapeutic Strategies. She is the past president of the American Epilepsy Society and is the past secretary of the American Society of Experimental Neurotherapeutics. She was the recipient of the American Epilepsy Society Lennox Award in 2017, uh, Service Award in 2015, the Epilepsy Foundation Hero Award 2013, and is an ILAE Ambassador for Epilepsy. She has authored over 300 articles and chapters, is the editor of three books and lectures, internationally on clinical trials and use of anti-epileptic drugs. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. French. Thank you so much. And it is my absolute pleasure to be here today and to talk to you uh, about new therapies and how excited I am as the Chief Medical and Innovation Officer of the Epilepsy Foundation to be able to tell you about all of these exciting new therapies. And uh, also we're gonna be launching a few polls. So I hope that you guys are paying attention so that you can answer the, the polls and uh, participate in this talk. Uh, I wish I was there with you in person, of course, uh, but maybe next time. So uh, this is a page of my disclosures. I work on behalf of a nonprofit called the Epilepsy Study Consortium, which works with a number of uh, companies, most of them uh, uh, pre-market, that is, they don't have a marketed drug yet, but they're trying to develop new therapies for epilepsy, and we try and help them. And uh, a, a portion of my salary is paid by the study consortium. So the first question that I would ask you is, we have so many drugs on the market already, do we need more anti-epileptic drugs? Well, the problem with the ones that we have uh, and I'm going to get into this in a little bit more detail in a second, is that whereas if I develop epilepsy tomorrow, there is a six out of 10 chance, as indicated by all these smiley faces, that uh, my seizures will be uh, controlled and I will be doing very well. There is also a four in 10 chance that my seizures actually will not be controlled by available medicines and I will be treatment resistant. And even if my seizures are controlled, that doesn't mean that I'm a happy camper necessarily because those medications have to be taken every single day. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit too. And those medications might cause adverse unwanted effects like sleepiness, difficulty concentrating, stomach problems, rash, and so many other things. So we need drugs that not only work better, but also are safer and, and more well tolerated for people. And this despite the fact that as this uh, very well-worn slide that pretty much everybody uses uh, indicates to you, we have had so many drugs approved in the last like 20, 30 years, when I started being an epilepsy specialist, we only had these drugs in gold down here. That was a very different time. And since then, through lots of clinical trials, we have added drug after drug after drug after drug. And the most recent ones are here. 
uh, rivaracetam, cenobamate, um, and fenfluramine. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a couple of uh, trends that uh, have come up in the last few years, from blockbuster to minibuster, treating resistant epilepsies, a little bit about rescue therapies, a little bit about personalized medicine. Uh, I'm going to talk about going from an anti-seizure medicine to a disease-modifying epilepsy medicine. So let's start with a little bit on that concept. So the ILAE, which is the International League Against Epilepsy, uh, this is our international organization that is responsible for a lot of the classification and nomenclature that we use in epilepsy, is actually thinking of changing the name of what we call the class of drugs that we use. Uh, we, uh, you may have heard your doctor talk about anti-epileptic drug, uh, but anti-epileptic suggests that it's actually treating the epilepsy, whereas actually our drugs, every single drug that we treat with right now is an anti-seizure drug. It treats the symptom of seizures. And I have this little man here to sort of give you an indication of what that means. So let's say this poor guy has pneumonia, right? And he's coughing. You know, there's a lot of other things that make us cough these days. But let's say he has pneumonia and he's coughing. The cough is making him feel very uncomfortable. I can give him a cough medicine and that will stop the cough and it will stop that symptom, but it doesn't do anything about the pneumonia. And that's why he's going to have to keep taking that cough medicine every single day until either the pneumonia goes away on its own or uh, it's not. Uh, what we really want to do is to treat the underlying cause of epilepsy if it's known, right? That would be an anti-epileptic drug, but the ones we have now are only symptomatic anti-seizure drugs. And I'm gonna give you a little good news about that as we go forward. So the first thing that I wanna talk about is this concept of blockbuster to minibuster. Uh, a decade ago, uh, and the dec decades before that, most of the development of new drugs were for the common epilepsies because people wanted a blockbuster. They wanted a drug that was going to treat the majority of people with epilepsy. And that meant most of the development was in these two types of epilepsy, focal epilepsy, which is when you have one little area of your brain that's electrically unstable and causing seizures for whatever reason. The seizures start focally and they can spread, uh, and they can spread to involve the rest of the brain, but they always start in a focus. Uh, and then the second type is idiopathic generalized epilepsy. We sometimes call it genetic generalized epilepsy. And that is when you are born with a predisposition for epilepsy. It's in your genes. And uh, that means that if you had an identical twin that had the same genes as you, that that identical twin would have over a 90% chance that they would also have generalized epilepsy. So these two syndromes actually account for three quarters of all people with epilepsy. So you say, well, if I'm a pharmaceutical company and I want to develop a new drug, wouldn't I want to go for those big syndromes? And the rest of epilepsy is actually a lot of small, rare, or what we call orphan syndromes, often with pediatric onset, often associated with developmental delay. And and it was in the past the situation that people would say, or these companies that were developing would say, um, you know, these, these populations are just too small. They're not worth our while. Um, and uh, these rare epilepsies fall into a group of epilepsies we call DEE, or developmental and epileptic encephalopathies. These are children that have many, many seizures and have lots of other things that are going on, usually with lots of uh, cognitive disturbance uh, and uh, perhaps other things wrong with them as well. But recently, drug development for many reasons has completely turned around. You know, there's now, you saw the list of companies on my first slide. There's a lot of specialty companies that are saying, I'm a small company and I have an idea for treating a small subset of the population whether it be, and these are some of the names of the syndromes of these uh, small orphan epilepsies, 
Dravet syndrome, CDKL5, which is the gene that causes this, GLUT1 deficiency, and others. And interestingly enough, it has completely flipped such that the, the majority of development is now in the rare orphan epilepsies rather than the common ones. But don't worry, those of you with focal epilepsy and with generalized epilepsy, there still is development going on in those areas as well. So if we look at this slide, this shows you from 2008 onward, the drugs that have been approved already by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. And you can see that some of them are for focal seizures, um, S like carbazepine, uh, Brivirastam or Briviact, um, uh, and the very, very new one that just got approved this year, which I'm going to be talking a little more about, which is Sinobamate or Excopri. Uh, however, since 2008, we also have these orphan syndromes that drugs are being approved for, such as Lennox Gastaut, infantile spasms, Dravet syndrome. Uh, tuberous sclerosis, and so on. And I'm going to be talking more about the one that was approved just this year, uh, fenfluramine or fintepla, uh, which is for the orphan syndrome Dravet. Just to give you ide an idea of how many drugs are now in development uh, for these orphan syndromes and the kind of orphan syndromes they're in development for, I don't have time to go into all of these, but for example, there's drugs still in development for Dravet and Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, Rett syndrome, uh, KCNQ2, which is another gene uh, related epileptic encephalopathy, CDKL5, uh, and many more. So now I wanna go into a little more detail about one of the drugs that was developed for an orphan syndrome, and this is fenfluramine or fintepla. Um, and it, it had an interesting origin, actually. Some of you may remember back in the 80s, we all remember the 80s, that there was a drug that was put on the market for weight loss called Fenfen. And that was a combination of high-dose fenfluramine and another drug called Fentermine. And it eventually was pulled off the market because it caused serious problems, including uh, uh, some fibrosis of the lungs that could make it hard for people to breathe, and also thickening of heart valves, which sometimes was very, very serious. Um, however, at the time, back in the 80s, some children were put on a low dose of one part of that called fenfluramine uh, uh, for these orphan syndromes, and it seemed to work. And there were a number of children for decades who were taking this drug fenfluramine, and there came a point where a company said, all right, well, this is not a good drug for weight loss, obviously. It causes these uh, serious problems in a high dose. Let's try an actual controlled trial in a low dose to see what happens. And lo and behold, and to see whether we can reproduce what happened to this group of children who took it, and lo and behold, they got really spectacular results. You know, I consider this really spectacular. So let me try and walk you through this. It's a little bit complicated, but in every trial that we do, we wanna make sure that we're looking at a true effect and not people's just expectations of improvement when they go into a trial. So we give them a sugar pill, which we call placebo. So people are taking, and in this case, children uh, with Dravet syndrome, are taking the drugs that they're taking to try and control their seizures, but they're still having many seizures breakthrough. So on top of those drugs that they're already taking, we're going to now add either a high dose of fenfluramine or a low dose of, I mean, this high dose, I should say, is still low dose compared to what they used to use for the weight loss, uh, a lower dose or this sugar pill of placebo on top of what they are already taking. And then they watch for several months and say, what happened to the seizures? Uh, and as you can see here, this right over here shows you the number of kids in the trial that had their seizures cut by more than half, greater or uh, equal to or more than half. And 70% of those kids, when they were put on the higher dose, had their seizures cut in half or more compared to only 7% where a sugar pill was added. 
Uh, and then if you even get to a higher percentage of having your seizures cut by three quarters, and these are really tough seizures, let me tell you, almost half the kids had their seizures cut by three quarters or more, and a handful were seizure free. So this is really quite spectacular results. And based on this, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, was able to approve this drug. Now, we still are keeping a close eye on the heart valve thickening to make sure that at this low dose, it's not happening. And what that means is that even now that the Food and Drug Administration has approved this drug, children are still going to have to come in and get special testing to look at heart valves for you know, about every six months to make sure that nothing is happening. But in the clinical trial, there really wasn't any evidence that this is occurring now. So that was good news. And in terms of um, you know, uh, people having other adverse events or problems or the children, you can see that um, uh, the low dose and the high dose didn't really differ that much in terms of the, the types of adverse events that were happening. Uh, and uh, on placebo, there was also side effects because people just have side effects. When you looked at serious side effects that caused people to stop treatment or people thought were serious, you can see that there actually wasn't a whole lot of difference between the sugar pill and uh, the low dose and the high dose. And that is very good news. Um, so now I would like to launch the first poll, Jessica, if that's possible. And uh, I would like you all to tell me, based on what you're seeing here, you know, if you, if you or your child starts in a clinical trial, you have an opportunity to try something very promising like fenfluramine, but there's also the possibility of side effects. So would you, a relative, a friend, or, or whatever, participate in a controlled trial for a new medicine if you met the criteria? And uh, Jessica, I'm going to uh, count on you since I can't see it to stop the poll when enough people have voted. All right, looks like we're at 60%. All right, let's see. Survey says. Is it showing? Because it's not showing to me. Ah, there we go. All right. I am very, very pleased with this answer that 70% of you said, yes, you would participate in a controlled trial of a new drug. I think that's fantastic. Um, and you know, I would say to you that the people who do participate in these trials and uh, their, their uh, you know, family members who participate in these trials are truly heroes. They are, um, you know, uh, they're going forward before other people do. And if it wasn't for those people, then we would never get these new therapies into the marketplace. So now I'm gonna uh, change a little bit and talk about resistant epilepsies. Uh, and we're thinking a new way now that epilepsies that don't respond to anti-seizure medicines, I showed you that about 60% do and 40% don't really have some fundamental difference. And we're you know, not thinking one drug for everyone. We really want to um, develop new drugs that are specifically for those 40% who have not been able to get control of their seizures. And you know, this, is, this is why, because uh, in uh, 2000, a study was done uh, using people who had new onset seizures, focal seizures mostly, uh, who went to their doctor and the first drug that they ever got for treating their seizures got about half of people seizure free. The second drug, if you didn't respond to the first one, only got about 13% more seizure free. And the third drug, only 1%. Uh, and then uh, combining all kinds of drugs after that, only three more percent, and the total number of people that were seizure free was about that number I showed you before, about two thirds or, or maybe up to uh, uh, 60 percent. The same study was done in 2012 when all of these new medicines had now been approved. I showed you how many drugs have now entered the marketplace since 2008. And sadly, even though we have so many more drugs, the number of people that were treatment resistant was almost the same. It had only gone from 64% seizure-free 
to 68% seizure-free. So all of those drugs, and we had only been able to get 4% more seizure-free. And that was very disappointing because every drug that was approved, obviously we were hoping would, would be that magic bullet for many people. And if you look at this slide, this shows you in the kind of add-on study that I was talking about, where people continue their other medication behind and then um, have this new drug or a sugar pill added on, and you see how many people get better. When you look at the number of people in those trials that became free of seizures for just three months, because these trials only last three months, so we're not even talking about a year or two years, uh, it's a very small number, um, one to two percent, maybe three percent. But having said that, there is this very hopeful uh, red line at the bottom, which is the new drug I'm about to tell you about, Sonobamate, where at the highest dose of 400 milligrams, 18 percent of the patients in the clinical trial, this is these treatment resistant patients, uh, almost a fifth of them became seizure-free for three months. And you can see how that really stands out compared to all the other drugs in terms of seizure freedom. And I'm gonna just show you a little bit more about that. Um, so uh, this is a little bit different way of looking at things than I showed you before. It's the same kind of trial where you add on either a sugar pill, which is this line down here, uh, a low dose, a medium dose, or a high dose of drugs. So the low dose is green, the medium is blue, and the high is red. Now we're looking at um, that three months that people are in the trial. Uh, the first four weeks were the ramping up of the drug, what we called titration, and then they were on a steady dose for the rest of the trial. And this little dot in each case says what percent of the patients were seizure free for that last period. So we're talking about a month here, a month here, a month here, a month here. And you can see that uh, the low dose was not that much better than the sugar pill in terms of how many people were seizure free, although by the end there was about 10% that were seizure free in that last month. But when you look at the middle dose and the high dose, now we're talking about 20% uh, of people who were able to get seizure free for that last month or 30% of people in the case of the highest dose. And when you look at how many people were actually seizure free for the entire time after they reached their target dose, it was only 1% for placebo, the sugar pill, 4% for the low dose, 11% for the middle dose, and 21% for the high dose. So. Um, here you go, again, a third of people maintaining that seizure freedom for three months. And these are people who were having, on average, about um, nine seizures a month before they went into this trial. So this is, or eight seizures a month, actually. Um, so this is really, really good news that people who have not responded to other medications really should give this a try because it might get them seizure free. Now. I told you the good news. I got to couple that with a little bit of bad news, and that is that there were side effects. Uh, somnolence means sleepiness, dizziness, fatigue, double vision, that's diplopia. And you can see that compared to the sugar pill or placebo, which is this group here, and you can see people still complain of sleepiness and dizziness, uh, even when they're on a sugar pill. But there was more when they went on the 100 milligram, even more when they went on the 200 milligram, and even more when they went on the 400 milligram, which was the most effective dose. Sometimes you can get rid of these side effects uh, by taking away background drugs that might be amplifying uh, these uh, effects. And uh, I have had several people now already uh, in my clinic who I've given uh, Sonobamate to who had side effects, but then took away some background drugs, uh, remained with very, very good seizure control, even when their background drugs were taken away. So that's uh, very optimistic. Um, however, there is another thing that we have to worry about, and that is that um, some of the people in the earlier studies, when the, when the drug was ramped up quite quickly, had something called DRESS, 
which stands for Drug Rash with Eosinophilia and Systemic Symptoms. Uh, and this can be a very, very serious thing. It can even kill you. Uh, and uh, we realize that in this case, as in many cases um, with drugs that we use for epilepsy, um, the slower we introduce that drug to your body, the less likely you are to have these kinds of rashes and serious reactions. Uh, some of you who have been on uh, lamictal or lamotrigine know that that has to be increased very slowly because we're trying to avoid rash. And this is the case with Sonobamate as well. They did a second safety study that the Food and Drug Administration asked them for where they ramped up the drug quite slowly, uh, took eight weeks to get to the target dose, uh, and in that study of 1,500 people, there were no cases of dress or serious rash. So we hope that slowing down that uh, uh, ramp up is actually going to go a long way in uh, uh, preventing this problem. So still a very, uh, uh, you know, a good looking drug from our perspective uh, that we think, uh, you know, needs to be tried more in the community now that the FDA has approved it to make sure it's safe and that we can uh, reflect that, that seizure freedom when it's actually used by people in the clinic. Now, I wouldn't be talking about new therapies if I didn't take one minute to talk about something that was very exciting to people, which is the idea of using uh, some sort of medical marijuana in order to treat epilepsy. Um, and this child who I'm showing you here is Charlotte Figgy, and some of you may know that unfortunately Charlotte Figgy passed away. Um, however, she was probably had a lot to do with the start of the enthusiasm and excitement about using medical marijuana. And medical marijuana so far, I just want to tell you, is another drug that has only been proven so far to be effective for these orphan syndromes and not for the common epilepsy. So we're now still talking about orphan syndromes. So Charlotte Figgy was diagnosed with an orphan syndrome called Dravet syndrome. Um, and as an infant was having hundreds of seizures a month. Her family, she lived in Colorado and her family was able to give her a strain of medical marijuana that had a high content of CBD or cannabidiol when she was age five, and this is also Charlotte uh, Figgy. Uh, and uh, her seizures became dramatically better. Uh, she started having only two to three seizures a month, all of them at night. Uh, and the, the uh, growers who grew this uh, strain started to grow a strain specifically for children with severe epilepsy, which was called Charlotte's Web. And you can see, again, we don't believe these things until we do a randomized controlled trial. And now you've seen something like this before um, with fenfluramine. And this is the same syndrome that I showed you the results in fenfluramine, um, where you see uh, the, it's, it's a little bit of a different way of looking at it. It's the, uh, the average reduction in seizures that the children had. And you can see that on average, um, about 40% uh, of them, uh, sorry, on average, they had a 40% reduction in seizures compared to the sugar pill, and this was only a single dose here, uh, which had an average of about 15% reduction. Um, and uh, this was in convulsive seizures, uh, and over here you see in total seizures approximately the same, maybe slightly less. So based on this data, again, the FDA said, yes, this does work in Dravet syndrome. And in addition, uh, in other open label studies, people have looked at other effects of cannabidiol. And this is the, again, a mixed population that took a cannabidiol in an open label study. Um, and you can see that the parents uh, of children uh, reported that they had uh, an improvement in energy and fatigue and in memory. This is what they had at baseline and the numbers are going up after they got treated. Uh, they felt less helpless. They had better social interactions um, and better quality of life. And of course, we're looking for those things in addition to looking for seizure control. Um, however, again, I always have to tell you the bad with the good. 
And even though people say this is a natural thing and people are very excited about the fact that they can take a natural plant rather than a manufactured pill, um, however, it does have side effects just like any medicine. So sleepiness, diarrhea, decreased appetite, um, and some other things were seen in um, more than 10% of the patients, but uh, most of it was mild or moderate and not severe. Uh, but you can see that uh, uh, more people who were on the Epidiolex or CBD uh, had serious side effects than on the sugar pill, and more had to stop the medication due to those side effects than on the sugar pill. And there were uh, 12 children who had um, high liver function tests, which were worrisome for safety, uh, compared to uh, only one on placebo sugar pill. Uh, all of those children were also taking the seizure medicine valproic acid. Uh, that's very important uh, because now we know that if children are taking valproic acid, we have to be more careful with epidiolex. The other thing to know is that a very small amount of this uh, drug actually gets absorbed through the gut, and the amount that gets absorbed is very much uh, 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 related to what you ate before you took it. So if you eat it with a, if you take this medicine with a fatty meal, you get four times as much going in as if you take it on an empty stomach. So obviously you're gonna to have to be careful about how you put it in with your meals and diet. Another thing that we've learned um, is that when you combine uh, this drug with Clobazam, which is another commonly used drug, particularly in these children with epileptic encephalopathy, that the amount of uh, norclobazam, which is what clobazam is turned into in the body, uh, you can see that um, the uh, placebo group uh, did not have an increase in their clobazam or norclobazam, um, whereas uh, if they were on cannabidiol, five milligrams, 10 milligrams, or 20 milligrams, uh, the norclobazam sometimes went up two and a half fold. Uh, and norclobazam uh, can make seizures better, but it al also can lead to significant sleepiness. You know, so much sleepiness that sometimes, you know, you can't wake the kid up. So that uh, if you combine these two drugs, you have to do it carefully and you have to make sure that you're watching that clobazam and adjusting it as time goes on. Some kids before we knew this actually ended up in the emergency room or the hospital uh, because they were difficult to arouse or they were um, aspirating um, and getting pneumonias and things like that. Uh, people say, okay, so this cannabidiol that's uh, sold as Epidiolex is good for epilepsy, maybe I should use medical marijuana that I get from the corner store, um, you know, or CBD from the supermarket. But the problem is that uh, the products that you get that are not the pharmaceutical grade can be variable. Um, and uh, some of them can, uh, depending on whether you get it from a dispensary or whatever, can have the other common ingredient in medical marijuana, which is THC. And that's the part that actually gets you high. Um, and uh, you know you don't necessarily want to have that in there, uh, and we don't know whether that THC actually does anything for epilepsy, although some people believe in what we call the entourage effect, which is that uh, a little bit of THC along with a lot of CBD might be better. But, but having said that, um, we really don't have any experimental or human data for that, uh, that that's well controlled. So we need more controlled trials to see whether that would actually be an approach. There's a lot of religion in this and, and so far no science. I'm gonna now switch gears and talk about rescue medicines. Uh, some of you may take rescue medicines, some of you may very well know what they are, other people not so much. Um, this is a treatment that is not given every day, uh, but is used uh, sort of uh, uh, in case of emergency break glass, uh, something that uh, you know, people can use when, they're in tr when they feel like they're in trouble and more seizures may happen. So sometimes seizures happen in clusters and people say, if I've had one seizure, I think another one or another one might happen uh, and I don't want that to happen. 
So can I take something that's gonna work right now to prevent more seizures? Um, or when there's a risk of seizure that's higher than usual, for example, I'm sick, I have a fever, um, and when I have a fever, uh, even though I haven't had a seizure yet, um, I may, you know, I may very well have a seizure and I'm very worried about this. So this is something to give you temporary greater control. Um, it's an important tool to reduce the need for an ambulance or an emergency trip or a hospitalization. You can think of it sort of like an EpiPen for seizures. Um, and we feel that many people can uh, benefit from having a rescue therapy available that puts control into their hands. Uh, before, very recently, the major uh, rescue medicine that was available to people was this one right here, which actually had to be administered through the rectum. Uh, not a very nice way to do it, and not one that many people were very interested in. Fortunately, now we have uh, many rescue therapies that have recently been approved, uh, nasal midazolam, nasolam, or nasal diazepam, valtoco, uh, or buccal clobazam, which you can put under the lip, uh, simpazam, um, that can be used. Uh, now, these drugs, as far as we know, uh, work in about five to 10 minutes. That means that I might be able to prevent the next seizure but I'm not gonna be able to prevent the seizure I'm having right now. It's not fast enough. There is a faster drug that's under development. It just went through some clinical trials and you can ask your doctor because there will be more clinical trials starting soon. Uh, and this is an inhalation product and you can kind of think of it like the asthma inhaler for epilepsy. Um, you just put it in front of somebody's mouth and the person takes a normal breath uh, they can even do that if their consciousness is impaired, um, and that aerosolizes it, uh, and that aerosol goes right into the lung. Um, sorry, and uh, that uh, may work in as little as two minutes, or maybe in some people even a little faster. Uh, so if it is particularly a prolonged seizure, it may be able to stop a seizure that's actually in progress, and that, that was what was being tested in the uh, successful trial that was just completed. I'm gonna move on to talk about um, personalized medicine. And this, you know, is supposed to display to you that as much as we know about epilepsy and treating epilepsy, there's a lot we don't know. So everybody kind of has a favorite drug to treat their newly diagnosed patients with. It might work or it might not work, uh, but they usually you know, use their favorite drug as their first drug all the time, even though it might not work. And some of you may be very familiar with you know, just trial and error. This one didn't work, try that one. This one didn't work, try that one. Wouldn't it be great if we were able to tell in advance rather than doing this trial and error that uh, you know this person's gonna be responding to Lamotrigine, this one to Topiramate, this one to something else. Um, and uh, we had some kind of roadmap. Uh, the idea being that we, don't, we would like not to take a cookie cutter approach. Uh, and this concept is called personalized, individualized, or precision medicine. That means rather than picking the same first choice for everyone, you use all the data you have to select the optimal choice individually for each person, and the choice is not the same for everyone. So there is a big search uh, for markers that will identify the appropriate targeted treatment so that we don't have to just keep spinning the wheel. Um, and you know, when we're looking for targeted treatments, one of the places that we look to is what are your genes? What are the building blocks that made you up? Not what happened to you af afterwards. And can that predict perhaps, um, you know, because now we can do genetic testing, um, can that actually predict um, whether uh, you're gonna respond to a drug or not? Uh, so uh, it's a little easier when we're talking about a single gene, uh, and it's a little harder when we're talking about multiple genes. All of us are made up 
of many genes that influence everything about us, what our hair color is, what our eye color is, maybe how we behave, how tall we are, and so on. But there's not one gene that tells you how tall you're going to be. It's like you inherit many different things, and that tells you how tall you're going to be. And you inherit many different things, and it probably tells you you have a risk for epilepsy. But having said that, over the last um, you know, uh, decade approximately, you saw how, how fast new therapies are growing. Well, new genes, single genes that say, this is a mutation in a gene, this gene went wrong, and now you're going to have epilepsy, are being discovered many, many, many genes. Now, most of them are genes that will give you this uh, rare syndromes, the epileptic encephalopathies, which are the severe uh, seizures of childhood and not the common ones, the focal epilepsy and the generalized epilepsy, although there are a few examples of where genes, uh, single genes can give you those more common epilepsies. But mostly we're talking about the orphan epilepsies and there have been many, many genes that have been identified. So far, not very many of them have actually led to, you can use this therapy to correct it, but it does give you an idea that there are certain drugs that you should avoid or you should use and are more likely to work. So, you know, this is a work in progress where knowing what your genes are may help us find the best treatment or the best drug. Uh, so here are some examples of some genes and what that would tell us about what we should or should not use uh, in order to treat you. Now, uh, currently, uh, what, what the treatment paradigm is, as again, many of you know, is you know we're gonna try a drug, and if that fails, we're gonna maybe try another drug, and if that fails, we're gonna combine different drugs. And if you fail a number of drugs, and you fall into that uh, 40%, then we're gonna call you treatment resistant. So this is the 40% who are drug resistant, and now what choices do they have? Well, it really falls into these three buckets of some kind of surgery, uh, trying more drugs, and you saw that there's many, many drugs to try, so we can keep trying those drugs, and as you saw in the figures I showed you, a couple percent of people will get seizure-free from trying these different drugs, uh, there's also a dietary approach, which is mostly used in the severe epilepsies of childhood. When you're talking about the surgeries, you're talking about a vagus nerve stimulator, which is something that goes into the neck, um, the uh, responsive nerve stimulator or deep brain stimulator, which go into the head with a surgery, um, uh, finding the seizure focus and cutting it out, um, or a new uh, approach, which is actually burning out a seizure focus. Uh, and uh, not everything is appropriate for everyone. So whereas you can find a seizure medicine pretty much for every type of epilepsy, some of the surgical approaches will, you need to have a seizure focus as far as we know, uh, in order for that to be effective. Uh, and that includes the stimulators that go into the brain, uh, obviously cutting the fo focus out or burning the focus out. So vagus nerve stimulator can work for all epilepsies, uh, but these other here, you need to have a seizure focus. And I just want to point out that uh, if you, uh, you do have an identified focus and it can either be cut out or burned out, then that can be a cure. So we are talking about anti-epilepsy rather than symptomatic treatment. That can be a cure. That's why we're always looking for people who are candidates for surgery or laser, laser ablation. Ketogenic diet in some rare cases can also be a cure. Just to give you a little more information on the deep brain stimulator uh, from Medtronic or the responsive neurostimulator from Neuropace, uh, the deep brain stimulator, actually, you don't have to be able to locate the focus, although you have to have a sense that the person does have focal epilepsy, so it's a little easier. You don't have to know the exact pinpoint place, 
Um, and so these uh, electrodes are implanted and go into an area, a deep area of the brain called the thalamus. Whereas the responsive neurostimulator, you want to get those electrodes pretty much right over the focus or close to the focus because it needs to detect when a seizure is about to happen from that focus and then it goes in to try and counter shock essentially and get that seizure to stop. So the deep brain stimulator is just going off routinely every five minutes, whereas the, as the name implies, the responsive neurostimulator is going off uh, as a response to a seizure that is trying to happen. Uh, those, both of those can uh, reduce seizures substantially, but they are not likely to be curative at this point. They probably act in some different way from the standard uh, therapies uh, by uh, disrupting synchronization in the brain in some way. We really don't know exactly why stimulation therapies work. Um, the advantage, one advantage of stimulation therapy is Yes, when they put those electrodes in, there are side effects that can happen, bleeds or infections. Um, but uh, once they're in, you usually don't know they're going off. You can't feel it. And you're not going to have the sleepiness, dizziness, and other things that you have from taking a medicine by mouth every day. Um, as I said, it's not usually a cure. Um, and you do need to have a seizure focus. And I just mentioned about um, the burning the focus. Uh, this is a brand new thing uh, that, that we're doing now. Usually neurosurgeons do it. Uh, it does not require, you know, if we know that there's a seizure focus, let's say in the temporal lobe in a part called the hippocampus, which is often the site of seizures. Um, if we can get a, a wire into there um, and we can heat up that wire with a laser and we can burn out that little area, we don't have to do a much bigger chopping out of that part of the brain. And also, uh, you don't have to stay for a long time in the hospital as you do with standard surgery. Um, usually, it only requires an overnight hospital stay. Uh, on the downside, uh, the rates of seizure freedom are slightly lower than when you go in and actually take a bigger piece of brain out, as you can imagine. Uh, the safety seems somewhat better than going in and doing a big surgery, as it also you might imagine, uh, and we're watching carefully, it is early days. I just want to point out other uh, new types of stimulators that are now coming into being. Uh, these also are being put in just by an office procedure. You don't have to go to the uh, operating room to get these put in. And these are electrodes. They don't stimulate. They don't treat in any way. All they're doing is monitoring. So they are capturing seizures as they are happening. And that allows the doctors to know more about the seizure pattern and about whether seizures are occurring or are not occurring. And that in and of itself, as I'm about to show you, may help us to control seizures. So what we are learning as these electrodes are being put into the head is that seizures are not so unpredictable as maybe we thought they were. So what I'm going to show you here is uh, these lines going up and down here are the amount of electrical instability, what we call spiking, that's happening in the brain. And you can see from the bottom here that we're talking about a very long time frame, months. Each of these is a month. Uh, and this is a single person. And what you're seeing is that the electrical activity in their brain is high, low, high, low, high, low. And this is going on every few, few weeks. It's going from high to low. Um, and when it's high, you can see that, in fact, the seizures, which are the red dots, are happening. And when it's low, no seizures are happening, right? So if we could know that that electrical activity is about to go high or is on its way up, uh, then we could say, okay, uh, this, is, this is a bad time for you. You better, you know, uh, not maybe, you know, be very careful about taking your medication, make sure you get lots of sleep, Maybe you'll take a rescue medicine, depending on how short that time is. There may be things that we can do. And at the very least, you know, we could tell you, give you some advance warning that this is going to be a bad time. 
So the Epilepsy Foundation is actually gave a huge grant to a, a number of groups that are trying to get some external markers. You can see that this is a subject in the trial uh, who has a wristband with a, you know, maybe a Fitbit watch and maybe an armband that's measuring some uh, skin conductance and maybe a patch. These are all external things um, and to see whether we can find that signal that that electrical activity in the brain is going up. And if so, we could provide a non-invasive seizure forecasting monitor that then could like tell you on your phone as this is showing here, you know, just like the weather report, you know, 80% chance of seizure, you know, 5% chance of seizure today. And we think that that would make people um, much more able to control their own epilepsy. Uh, so let's uh, launch the next poll. Uh, sorry, that the not that poll, the, the other poll. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, one second. We want. There we go. This poll. Yes. Okay. How would you use a seizure prediction device if it warned you that you were at a high risk for a seizure soon? Uh, would you take a rescue medicine? Would you take an extra dose? Would you not leave home that day? Or do you think you wouldn't use one? All right, we'll give everyone a minute. The votes are rolling in. Gives me an opportunity to give a shout out to the investigators for this work uh, from the Mayo Clinic and K King's College London um, and uh, from Australia uh, and SEER Medical, which is a group that uh, that's uh, uh, trying to create this device. Okay, let's take a look at the results. All right. Survey says, um, so everybody thinks that they would do something and everybody thinks they would use it. So that is great. We must be on the right path then. Um, so this, this effort is called My Seizure Gauge and stay tuned because maybe over in the next few years, we'll be able to do something in this regard. Okay. Um, so uh, the last thing that I wanna talk about is going from anti-seizure drugs to anti-epilepsy drugs. So to repeat, the drugs that are now available to treat epilepsy are actually anti-seizure drugs. They don't act to stop the cause of seizures or work to prevent future seizures, which is why you have to keep taking them day after day after day. Uh, but as we gain a better understanding of what causes seizures, and in many people we still don't know, uh, we'll be able to maybe treat the root cause, uh, like treating the pneumonia, not treating the cough. Uh, and I already alluded to the fact that um, some epilepsies are caused by mutations in genes. So genes produce proteins all throughout your life. Uh, and those proteins do different things to keep the body humming along. Uh, if you have a mutation in a gene and you always have a good copy and a bad copy, the bad copy mutated gene isn't spitting out that normal protein that's going to go about and do its business. It's spitting out either an abnormal protein or no protein at all. And as this goes along, you know, you think about Dravet syndrome, uh, which I told you was a genetic disease. It, there's a gene mutation in a gene called SCN1A. Um, it just keeps, you know, spitting out this bad protein and the brain gets worse and worse over time. And these children uh, who are perfectly normal at the age of one start to get worse and worse and worse as they get older. So uh, there is, I'm very excited to say, trials coming even in the very next year, this coming year, uh, which will work on trying to fix these bad genes. So there are a couple of approaches. Uh, one is, uh, I said you had a good copy and a bad copy. So there are uh, drugs that are called antisense oligonucleotides. They get injected <laughs> into the spinal uh, fluid. They go up to the brain and they basically silence the bad copy. And they let the good copy just go ahead and produce the normal protein. And it turns out while this nonsense protein is out of the way, 
the good copy is, is going to produce more protein. And that's why the company is called Stoke, because they're stoking up the good protein uh, and hopefully getting rid of the bad protein. This approach was already uh, used for spinal muscular atrophy, which is another single gene disease to enormously beneficial effect. These are children who are, are born uh, pretty normal, but then over time they lose their ability to, to use their muscles. Uh, and with uh, this and other genetic treatments, uh, these children are doing much, much better and able to walk and do other things that they would normally have not been able to do. Um, in addition, there is another company called Encoded uh, that is working on an actual gene therapy where you get um, uh, you, you uh, inject something in the spinal fluid that actually goes up to the brain uh, and uh, takes out the bad copy of the gene and, and just inserts right in there a good copy of the gene. Um, and uh, hopefully that's a different way to fix that. That would be a one-time thing. Uh, you use that gene therapy once uh, and you're fixed, as opposed to the antisense oligonucleotide that probably you would need repeat spinal injections in order to get fixed. Um, we don't know which one of those are going to work yet, but we know, you know we're very happy that a number of different shots on goal are going on. Um, and there are other uh, shots on goal as well um, uh, that are even as simple as a pill that you take every day. So now let's launch that last poll. Mm. If there was a gene therapy that would change the genes, the very genes building blocks in your brain and fix your disease, and it had to be put in through a spinal tap, would you want that therapy? All right, here we go. Wow, thank you to everyone voting. Give another minute, people are still Citing their answer looks pretty positive, though. All right, let's share. There you go. So people are excited about this opportunity, and I think we should be. You know, these will be genes that uh, these will be uh, treatments that actually are anti-epilepsy as opposed to just anti-seizure. So thank you, and uh, I'm just going to give you quickly another example. Uh, which is already on the market. Uh, and this is for a, a genetic disorder called tuberous sclerosis. Again, this is a, a, what we call an autosomal dominant single gene disease. If you have it, then there's a 50-50 chance that you're gonna pass it on to your children as is often the case with these diseases. Um, and this particular problem is one in the mTOR pathway, what we call, and, and this signaling pathway regulates how brain cells grow and multiply. And when there's a disruption in that pathway, cells start to grow out of control. And you can see this, uh, this top figure here is a, a brain sliced, uh, you know, it's actually a, a, a scan, an MRI scan, a, a neuro, neuroradiology scan. And you can see this big piece of tissue that isn't supposed to be there, this big white thing. Um, that has grown out of control because there's this disruption. And many of these people have what we call tubers all over their brain that are abnormal little pieces of growths all over their brain because they have this tuberous sclerosis. And there is actually a drug that you take by mouth, and it's not a one-time thing. You have to take it every day, but it, it basically tries to inhibit that pathway so that this abnormal growth doesn't happen. And you can see in this particular person's case, there was a big old goober there. And then after they took this medicine, it basically shrinks away without surgery. A lot of these people have epilepsy. And so somebody said, well, whether they have these you know, obvious masses on their, on their uh, imaging or whether they don't, can we give them this medicine and can we improve their seizures as well as making these lumps in their brain shrink, shrink? And you've already seen something like this before. This is the amount of seizure reduction they got. The orange is the sugar pill and then the middle dose and the high dose or the low dose and the high dose. 
And you can see, this is a little hidden here, but this is 40%. So uh, on average, people at the high dose had 40% uh, less seizures than they had had. And this is only during the three months of the original trial, but we're talking here about not something that treats the symptom of seizure, but treats the epilepsy. So there is a potential, and it was seen in the long-term follow-up, that these kids could get better and better and better over time. And that's what you really want from disease-modifying medication. So in conclusion, much is new in the epilepsy field. There's uh, more in the pipeline to come, I promise you. Uh, and hopefully all of these advances will lead to better quality of life for people with epilepsy. Thank you so much for being very attentive and answering the polls.